Hey everyone, let's talk mainstream gaming CPUs. For years now, there's only been one single default choice, Intel's Core i5 line. I mean, you bought those processors for two reasons. Firstly, you get great out of the box performance. And secondly, you can overclock them to your limits and your baseline system has a lifespan of four, five, possibly even six years. Many of you are possibly considering an upgrade now and the 7600K, the latest model, well, that's a good chip. But things are changing and AMD's Ryzen 5 line is really difficult to ignore. I'm hoping that by the end of this video, you'll realize just what an exceptional release Ryzen 5 actually is. So I'm going to be looking at two Ryzen's for this piece, both of which are highly impressive, the Ryzen 5 1600 and the 1600X. They're based on exactly the same processing architecture with just a 400 megahertz clock rate differential in both base and boost frequencies. 3.2 gigahertz base on the 1600, 3.6 on the X, and so forth. Everything else is the same, same cache, same six core 12 thread layout, and crucially, both can be overclocked. Ah, but there are two more differences of note. The base model actually ships with AMD's Wraith Spire Cooler, whereas you need to front up extra cash for a cooler on the X model. And that's kind of interesting, bearing in mind that the X actually costs $30 more. So there's actually two fascinating battles playing out here. Ryzen 5 versus Core i5 and Ryzen 5 1600 versus 1600X. And to my mind, on both counts, there is only one winner. So let's get on with it. As always, my focus is on gaming, but to ignore Ryzen's productivity credentials would be insane when they're just so good. Quick synthetic bench first. Cinebench R15, where the results are predictable. Multi-thread performance sees AMD's entry-level 12 threads massacre Intel's 4. Get an extra 74% of performance compared to the i5 score here, and the 1600X widens the gap further. However, on single thread performance, the i5 is about 16% faster than the X and 24% faster than the baseline 1600. Now let's talk video encoding. No synthetic benches here. This is an actual video encode we use for our video download site, digitalfoundry.net, encoding 4K content in both H.264 and HEVC. Seriously hardcore stuff then, and the results are clear. Intel doesn't stand a chance on H.264 encoding with a 42% AMD advantage, though you will note that the i5 is much closer on HEVC workloads. It was the same story with Ryzen 7 versus Core i7 quads, of course, but the gaming situation was slanted more in Intel's favor. The situation is considerably more complex on the Ryzen 5 versus Core i5 side, so I'm gonna break it down into maximum theoretical performance, and more kind of real life gaming scenarios based on today's gaming rigs. So what do I mean about theoretical then? Well, this first bunch of tests is all about pushing gaming workloads as much as we can by removing the GPU as the bottleneck. And to do this, as always, we overclock Titan X Pascal and run our tests at 1080p resolution at max settings or close to it. So the idea here is that the CPU has to simulate ultra level scenes and pump the maximum level of draw calls to the GPU and run that game as fast as it possibly can. It's a methodology that didn't do Ryzen 7 too many favors, but this time it's a very different story. We'll start off with stock clock comparisons and why not kick off with our punishing Witcher 3 Novigrad City test. Both Ryzen 1600 and the X are comfortably beating the stock i5. 1600X is 14% faster than the i5, the non-X model about 9%. It's a great beginning to our testing here and shows that many cores and many threads can beat out the brute force single thread performance of the i5 quad. Our Assassin's Creed Unity bench is also fascinating. The i5 is seemingly the fastest chip here with a 121 frames per second average versus 116 on the 1600 and 119 on the X. So there's not much in it basically, but you'll notice something curious here. In the heavier workloads, like this initial vista shot of the Notre Dame scene with tons of NPCs, the i5 is struggling a bit and Ryzen 5 is faster. However, in less challenging areas, the i5 pulls ahead, raw single thread power offering a small advantage where workloads aren't so crazy. So there's an argument here that Ryzen is more useful in areas where the CPU is actually under more heavy stress. 
those extra frames in less challenging areas, the places where the i5 is stronger. I mean, how much use are they? This isn't a one-off either. I can actually demonstrate this far more dramatically in Crisis 3. This game loves cores, it loves threads, and it loves Ryzen. And it's not particularly friendly to the i5. Right from the off, both 1600 and 1600X are beating it by a huge margin and the frame times on the i5 side are particularly poor with some distressing stutter. Across the whole benchmark, the base 1600 is 26% faster, while the X extends that lead to 32%. But what I really want to show you is this. As the scene pans away from the vista ahead, the i5 suddenly shoots into the lead. But as we pan back to the landscape with all of those draw calls, the i5 craters, while both Ryzen's offer a much smoother experience. I mean, holy crap, look at the frame times there on the i5. Here's another example of the Intel chip shooting ahead in a non-complex scene, swiftly accompanied by a catastrophic drop in frame rate and terrible stutter. Ryzen, well, both 1600 and the X are handling things quite nicely. Rise of the Tomb Raider DX12 now. This game recently had a Ryzen enabling patch and the results are fascinating. And once again, it's bad news for the i5. Parallel lines on the graph here for Ryzen, with 1600X providing a small bump in performance over the non-X model, but it's hardly a game changer, right? Meanwhile, on the i5, depressed performance and yes, once again, nasty frame time stutter in certain areas of the geothermal valley. The division next, not exactly an awesome demonstration of CPU power, even with an overclocked Titan X handling GPU duties. And the results are essentially margin of error when we look at the frame rate averages. However, this massive dust cloud at the end of the bench shows the i5 holding its performance better while the Ryzen's struggle. It's interesting to point out areas like this because in the world of average frame rates and even 99th percentiles, performance just makes more sense when you can actually see why drops in frame rate and increased frame time stutter are actually happening. And of course, none of this is to say that the i5 is completely outclassed at stock clocks on every game. Far Cry is my go-to engine for an example of the importance of single-thread performance, and the 7600K's stock performance is staggeringly good here. 28% faster than the 1600, 22% faster than the X. Intel has an IPC advantage, and it also has a clock advantage. So the 1600 runs at 3.2 GHz, the 1600X at 3.6 GHz, and the i5 at 4 GHz here. I'm actually a bit annoyed that I don't have the non-K7600 or indeed the 7500 here because then we'd have a much closer grouping of clock speeds. But regardless, I think the point here is clear enough. If this were a non-K comparison with the stock Ryzen's, the results would further favour AMD in the games it's strong at while chipping away at the results in the titles where the i5 excels. Stock performance takeaways then. This is no rerun of Ryzen 7 versus Core i7. Ryzen 5's 12 threads have the ability to comprehensively power ahead of the latest i5. Modern game engines tend to favor many core performance over single core designs and even clock for clock, the base 1600 seems to do just fine against a similarly clocked i5. Add on top the overwhelming productivity victories for both of the six core Ryzen 5s and I think I can safely say that I can easily recommend either the 1600 or the 1600X over any locked core i5 processor. The proviso being that I do recommend fast memory. 3200 MHz isn't cheap, but do a little research and it should be possible to overclock slower speed kits to get there. Choose with care though, Ryzen really does like DDR4 using Samsung's modules. Okay, so let's talk overclocking. Only the 7600K will overclock from Intel and overclockable RAM only runs on a Z170 or Z270 board, while any Ryzen and any memory kit can be overclocked even on cheaper B350 boards. This makes the cost of ownership lower for AMD and it can pay off handsomely. Okay, so attach a meaty cooling solution to your Intel board and the i5 tops out at 4.8 gigahertz. Some people have even hit five gigahertz with certain chips. Ryzen, yeah, it's a little bit more limited. My 1600X hit 4 GHz while the standard 1600 maxed at 3.8, even under a closed loop water cooler. 
But here's the thing, my 1600 also hit the same 3.8 gigahertz with very reasonable temperatures with the supplied Wraith Spire cooler. That's 200 megahertz faster than the 1600X. So let's look at some gaming overclocking results between the 7600K and the base 1600. And at the same time, remember that I'm actually using a Corsair H110i GT closed loop cooler on the i5 and the in the box heatsink and fan from AMD. So we're talking about a hilarious mismatch of frequencies and cooling. And what it basically means is that where the i5 excels, it brutally smacks down the Ryzen 5. So yes, Far Cry Primal with its insatiable need for single thread performance. 4.8 GHz i5 has a 1 GHz advantage over our plucky 1600. And this translates into a massive 39% lead overall. And with results like that, I'm sure there are plenty of Intel fans out there thinking that the games where Ryzen wins convincingly will see their performance advantages cancelled out. Well, let's return to AC Unity and you'll see that the MPC heavy info scene, well, the overclock ain't doing a huge amount. But in the areas where the CPU isn't being taxed so heavily, yes, it shoots ahead. A 1 GHz lead isn't going to be a game changer here, though. The Witcher 3 then, the 4.8 GHz i5 overclock gives it a small win. But again, there is no massive advantage here that justifies the amount of cooling and power consumption the 7600K will be using at such a high clock speed. Remember, the 1600 here is only at 3.8 GHz and we're using the out-of-the-box cooler. Moving on then, Rise of the Tomb Raider. Yup, the Geothermal Valley pummels CPU and in DX12 it loves many thread processors like the Ryzen 5. With an extra 1 GHz in the bank, the i5 can compete with the Ryzen 5 processors. We'll end the overclocking analysis with Crisis 3. The i5 does even better in those areas where not much is going on. But even at 4.8 GHz, it still tanks badly in draw call heavy scenes where multi-threading clearly makes a huge difference. So we're talking theoretical performance here because only some kind of crazy maniac like me basically would pair a $200, $250 CPU with GTX 1080 class GPU performance. We have propelled CPU and memory bandwidth performance to the forefront here, but the reality is that these are mainstream processors that will be paired with far less capable graphics cards, like Nvidia's GTX 1060 for example. So let's rerun some of these overclocking results this time with the 1060 and let's see what happens. The Witcher 3, well, the GPU ceiling drops frame rates dramatically, but the i5 actually carves out a small 4% advantage here. I was expecting parity, to be honest, but the bottom line is that both chips will give a great experience here at ultra settings. Now let's look at games where the i5 and Ryzen have distinct advantages. First of all, Far Cry Primal, which loves the i5 so much, Across the entire benchmark, we are entirely GPU bound, meaning that the single thread advantage of the i5 is cancelled out completely. This is the lowest frame rate point in the benchmark, and yes, both chips are handing in identical performance. Finally, Crisis 3. If you watched my Skylake X video, you may remember that I pegged this game as the most intensive CPU workout I'd seen. So here's the thing, remember I said that the i5 only wins out in less complex scenes? Well with a GTX 1060 you won't see that, you'll hit GPU limits instead. So I concentrated my test in the area directly in front of that benchmark scene to ensure a heavy CPU load. The scenes aren't 100% matched up and we bounce between being CPU bound and GPU bound at any given point, but let's take a look. Ryzen can be 10, 15 frames per second faster, despite operating with a 1 GHz deficit. But if we stop and look here, the even frame time line on the 1600 suggests we are limited by GPU, while the ugly stutter on the 4.8 GHz 7600K says we are CPU limited there. So there we go. I mean, I can't test every single game, but I do know that the future and indeed most of the present in terms of game engine design is many core in nature and Ryzen 5's 6-core 12-thread offerings are pretty awesome. The only other issue I'd like to bring up is future-proofing. Now, you can upgrade from an i5 to an i7, and it tends to resolve the multi-threading issues we've seen in our testing here. The ultimate gaming performance you can get right now from Ryzen, well, that's the Ryzen 7 series with a 4.0 GHz overclock. It's good, and you'll note here in Crisis 3 that the 1700 at 4 GHz can still beat the 7700K at 4.8 GHz in heavily threaded scenes. But generally speaking, 
Across all of our test games, the 7700K is generally the faster chip. On the flip side though, AMD is committed to the AM4 motherboard platform with future Ryzen generations, whereas all the signs point to Intel mothballing Z270 and moving to Z370 with its new Coffee Lake processors, which will include six core i5s and i7s, and I kind of suspect that they will indeed outperform Ryzen 5 and indeed Ryzen 7. In the here and now though, there are two takeaways from me. Firstly, AMD has a great contender with the Ryzen 5 6-core chips. Gaming performance is great overall. Those extra threads can lead to a more future-proof experience compared to Intel's current top-end i5, and the 1600 in particular is a star. I got the max overclock from the supplied cooler, and while the 1600X clocked faster, I don't think the extra 200 MHz I got is worth spending the extra money required to get a third-party cooler. Basically, Ryzen 5 six-core offerings are AMD at its absolute best, innovative, disruptive, but most of all providing exceptional value and competition for the consumer. So that's where I'm gonna leave things for now. Do like and subscribe to support this kind of work. We try to be original and distinct with our coverage, but it takes time and effort to source the quality of data that we need to really get to the bottom of how hardware works. Your support is welcome, whether it's here on YouTube uh, with a like or a subscribe or supporting our Patreon, where you can grab high quality video downloads of everything we do. Oh yes, and do please consider following us on Twitter for all of the latest Digital Foundry updates. But that's all from me for now. Thanks for watching.